Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. So as mentioned, uh, I'm hopefully graduating uh, this semester. Um, and this is uh, actually my thesis talk. Um, I don't quite have a job talk ready yet, but uh, basically Bill said this should be sufficient, so keep that in mind. Uh, structurally, people should, I don't know, ask questions during it, I would think. Yeah. Um, that's the way that the thesis went, so I think that'll be fine, so feel free to, to pipe up at any point. Um, and of course, uh, the title is Community Cellular Networks. So first I have to mention all of my collaborators, which there are a great many. Uh, Shadi Hassan is probably the uh, one of the, the uh, another graduate student at Berkeley who's been working on this stuff. And Kashif Ali, this is really the team, is the three of us. Uh, of course, my advisors, Eric Brewer and Tappan Parikh, um, and a bunch of other organizations and people all over the world. So I want to give a little bit of background. I'm going to start using the clicker now because I have a clicker. Uh, a little bit of background on, on cellular telephony. Um, it's probably the most impactful technology since the light bulbs. Um, with over 6 billion subscribers in about 25 years. You take that and compare that to the internet, which has about 2 billion subscribers and was started in really uh, the, I would say, the early 70s. Um, and there's numerous studies which show various development benefits. We can argue about these. I prefer not to argue about these. But generally, the idea is cell phones are good. People use them. People like them. It's a positive thing in the world. Um, but you'll notice that 6 billion is not the population of the Earth. Um, by most estimates, there are about 700 million people who just don't have cellular access in the world. Um, and the goal of our project is essentially to bring telecommunications to that remaining 700 million people. Um, and so this invites the first question of why don't they have cellular coverage? Um, and there's really two answers. The first is just that basic economics, right? Rural areas are more expensive for them to install equipment in. They have to install power, they have to install roads, they have to install all this stuff that you don't have to do in an urban area, or you have other solutions for in an urban area. Um, and so at the same time, they have less users. And so at some point, those you know, price demand curves cross, and it's no longer economically feasible for carriers to operate in these areas. Um, and so the carriers don't want to operate in them. Sometimes they're forced through to things like, through things like universal service obligations, but in general it's just not economically beneficial for them. Um, the second piece of this is structural, which is that the only people allowed to bring coverage to these areas are big nation-scale telecommunication firms. So when that profit motive doesn't work, no one is there, uh, no one's allowed to come and bring coverage there anymore. So you see a bunch of spectrum which is ostensibly owned, like in Indonesia there's five license holders, actually I think there's three license holders, some of them are sub-licensees, for the entire band across the entire country. So if you're in an area where you want to set up a network, that spectrum is used and that's the enforcement mechanism to keep it so that only these major firms can do that. Um, so how are we going to fix this? The first thing we're going to do is that we're going to reduce the cost of installing rural cellular equipment. Um, and this is both a capital expenditure, which is you know, just the hardware, the tower, power generation, and the ongoing cost of operating the tower, which is mostly fuel and maintenance. Uh, and the second piece is we're going to enable these things we call community cellular networks, which are basically locally operated small scale community networks. Um, this is what we like to call bottom up cellular networks versus this top-down model with na nation-scale firms coming in and bringing communication to that community. The community itself actually brings communication to itself. Uh, I think it went fast, you see. Yeah. So in the rural areas where you said it's the infrastructure is not available, so people, I mean, for the cellular operator, there's no incentive for them to yeah. put something there, right? But unlike the urban areas, are there any sharing that people do? Uh, sharing of? In the, the infrastructure, for example, maybe a tower that can be shared by 15... Uh, oh, we're going to get into that. No. The thing, like, that. yeah, when you're a major firm, you sort of have these, like, stock ways of doing things, and you bring your tower, and you bring your generator, and someone else brings their tower and their generator. Sometimes people actually share full towers, um, and then the backup and all that stuff, but in general, no. Um, you know, there's just a couple ways to do this, and you do that in that way. You're not really able to utilize things, at least outside of telecom, in any meaningful way. Um, so, uh, going into reducing the cost of, uh, yeah, sorry. You didn't mention the spectrum. What do you want to do about spectrum? Oh, that's a big question. Uh, we're going to basically run pirate networks for right now and then have a bunch of answers. So, uh, we'll, go, we'll go into that later in the talk. But you're, that's the big thing like hanging over this project is licensing and regulation. Um, Shadi in particular has, we, we just pushed a wonderful paper on GSM, like cognitive base stations and GSM white space. Basically make an argument this spectrum is totally unused in these areas. It's available. We just need a regulatory framework to support it. 
And so now we've proposed a regulatory framework and a technical system to resolve that problem. We'll see, you know, it, regulations are slow. Right now it's illegal. Right now it's illegal. But at the same time, in a rural area, it, there's like five illegal radio stations in our area. Like, there's no regulation effective, there's no effective regulation in where we work. Um, just because, you know, the, in, we work in Indonesia. Tel, uh, Cominfo is this, um, is the big FCC per, group there. For them to come to our community and find and shut down this tower is an enormous amount of work for almost no benefit. And then the community is upset at them, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll fight back, all this stuff. There's just no real reason for them to do that. They're, they're there to protect the interests of the telecoms. And we're so far away from the telecoms, there's not really any concern. So pirate operation sounds really bad, but it's quite functional in most like, hard rural areas. The, I can, the guy we work with runs a similar, I shouldn't say that, I'm recorded. I've heard of other systems that are uh, being run in the exact same area. And we've actually scanned and seen them. So anyway. So for the first piece is reducing the cost of a, of a cellular deployment. Um, so you might think that a cell phone tower is something like this. Uh, this is a big block unit with a big fat generator in front of it and there's a tower above it and it's you know, a building and it's got a, a, that, that's this, uh, petrol of some sort and then a big rack mount or a big, uh, you know, big iron solution inside of it. So this is what a traditional cell phone tower was like. It's like $500,000. A big deal. But uh, Moore's Law has finally come to telecom and now we have things like this. So this is a Range Networks 5150 base station and full disclosure I am a consultant for Range Networks, they pay me. Um, so this is just a small rack mount unit, about $10,000 full telco basically. It's not even just a cell phone tower, it's a full telco. Like you've got all the routing and all that internal. And then you can go down to this thing and this is an Edis Research B100. So this thing, you plug it into your laptop, you can do the same thing as that, this is $700. So we've gone from this big thing, $500,000, to being able to run your own tower for significantly less. The cost is the amplifiers, right? Um, that's a big cost, but no. I mean... What is the biggest cost? Uh, in one of these or in one of these? Yeah, one of these. Um, it's actually most of the fences and generators and all this stuff right now. Because this stuff, this like core radio amplifier stuff is pretty cheap right now. So you can put together a full base station so for about $2,000 right now. This is amplifier, uh, radio, like CPU. No, no, full power. 20 watts? Yeah, whatever amplifier you want. Ours in, in uh, so we put our station together for about $10,000. Uh, it's got a 10 watt unit in it, 10 watt amplifier. We could have put a 50 watt in it if we wanted. It, it's, in GSM it just turns into how many channels versus broadcast power, we don't need that many channels. So yeah, it's $2,000 for that piece. Right, it's, it's the rest of the cost that really starts to dominate, specifically, um, power, what you'll see. So even in a, in a modern base station, uh, you still have about $15,000 for power generation. This is assuming best case, solar, batteries, all these like really nice solutions. It still dominates the rest of the cost, up to $18,000 total, 15,000 power. So if we wanted to reduce the cost of a cellular installation in a rural area, it's really about reducing the power draw of the base station. That is the critical piece. Um, so how do we do that? This is the inside of our, our 5150. We put it in a, in a box so we could tr uh, tower mount it. That's like tree mounted, you'll see. Um, and here's all the power consumption of all the pieces inside of it. So the CPU is just you know, 10 watts, small thing. We get that down to 3 watts now with an ARM board. Uh, the radio down here, 10 watts. Can't really do too much about that. The switch does almost nothing. Duplex is passive. Power amplifier, boom, 40 watts to 135 watts. It dominates the power consumption of the entire unit. So if we want to, let me see if I have a slide for this, yeah. So if we want to reduce the power draw of the base station, we have to touch the power amplifier. You can't just do clever software tricks. Um, there's only so much we can do. We have to be able to touch that piece. Um, now what you'll see in most networks is just duty cycling. Basically you just turn the base station off for some period of time uh, and that's your way to save power at night, for instance. Uh, pretty common solution, especially here in Pakistan actually. You hear about it a lot. But we did some field interviews and this is really not a sufficient solution for most people. And the reason is that emergencies are really, really important. Uh, sometimes you have to make a communication at a certain time. If the base station is unavailable, that's really, really bad. And so we piloted a bunch of like asynchronous communication systems and everyone was like, this works a little bit, but we really need to, to be able to send a message right now sometimes. And that was really hard to do with a, a full asynchronous system. So we can't just do naive duty cycling. Um, what we can do instead is virtual coverage, which is uh, basically just a smarter form of duty cycling. So Here's a cell phone tower, my wonderful uh, diagrams, and here's happy users and here's coverage. 
So in normal coverage, everyone is covered all of the time, right? You've, everybody's got signal that's going full blast all the time. Uh, and people can make calls whenever they want, little lightning bolts are people making calls. Some of you have seen pieces of this deck before. I've used this walkthrough multiple times. Um, but the network stays up even when it's not being used. For example, at night. And that's really bad if you're trying to run this on things like solar panels. Right? Because that's where you're going to have to put all the battery back up and all of that. So we're just sitting here broadcasting at night. No one's communicating. It's just wasted. This is exacerbated in rural areas. Right? You have even less people, so you have a lot more idle time at night and a lot more wasted power. But at the same time, these people want to communicate. So in virtual coverage, what we do is we actually just turn the power amplifier off when the base station's not in use. This is an idle mode we basically added to the GSM protocol. Um, so the base station's idle, no one has any signal. If they want to make a call for an emergency or some other purpose, what they do is they send a little burst to the tower, which is still listening, because you don't need the amplifier to listen, you need the amplifier to broadcast. So the base station sits there running and just listening with the power amplifier off. It comes to the base station, the base station hears it. Oh, sorry, I have to say how it sends it. So we've, we've modified a phone, this is Osmocom BB, the open source handset. Um, so we've modified the actual phones that basically you can just dial and it will send the message, connect immediately and connect the call. Or there's, for, backup, or for, for legacy systems, we also have this thing called the wake up radio, which is just a button that just sends a broadcast. It's a trivial piece of hardware. Um, but you can just walk up, press this button, and then uh, signal will come back. And you'll have network connectivity for some period of time. Um, and now you can make your calls while the network is up. I'm, uh, people look a little more puzzled now than before. So the question that I have about this yeah. is, is, first off, how do you decide how long it's up and how do you know when it's up or when it's not up? Um, so the second question is really easy, whether you have signals or not, signal on your phone or not, right? So your bars just disappear. Yeah, gone. Now, if you have the modified uh, f uh, baseband, you could be a little smarter and be like, I know that I'm in the range of one of these towers, so I'll give like a signal to the user saying they have coverage, but it's this virtual coverage rather than the real coverage, and all it is to them is just latency on the call. Um, but then if the base station was actually down, it wouldn't know any different. Uh, the first question, I forgot the first question already. But it's, it's, it's more, <coughs> I, second question answered actually, so it's fine. Okay. Everybody in that area has this device. So it depends, right? Like, so you'll see in our installation in, in Papua, what we did is we just like duct tape them to a couple trees and throughout the community. People would walk a little bit and hit the button. If you're in a somewhat wealthy area, that's obviously an incredibly cheap piece of hardware. All it does is you press a button and it broadcasts at a certain frequency. It just needs to broadcast noise at this point. We don't even have a protocol for what's being sent. In which case, we think we can produce that thing for five dollars. Yeah. You could sell them, you could give them out to individuals. We've talked about using this for sort of uh, really wide sparse areas like national parks. If people really need emergency service, they can walk in and you know, just take one as they come into the park and leave one as they go out, things like that. So there's multiple solutions. It really depends on the context. But the technology supports either one, obviously. Yeah, please. Yeah, um, so uh, so this is based on the fact that uh, the power consume and actually very, very less than the power consume. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. Yeah. And are you using any polling mechanism to actually you know, shut off the um, polling mechanism something? We haven't seen any yet. It, it's a good question. Okay. Um, and it's something we're worried about because uh, you'll see in the future work what we're trying to do is basically do this so f the GSM is a TDMA protocol which means that we can actually turn off the power amplifier per slot and get a lot of these benefits without ha having the phone see no bars. But then you've got an amplifier that's going, you know, just on and off constantly, it's going to explode. Um, and we're not really good power amplifier designers in our group, uh, and so we're still looking at that. But yeah, you, you'll see some of those problems. Just clarification. Yeah. You're going after places that lack not only cellular networks, but they also lack landlines. Yes. So they're usually on grid. Um, no, they're usually off grid too. They're usually, like, I don't know how to generalize too much. Um, we think this would run just fine in areas with landlines. There's, in our community in Papua, there's a couple sat phones installed, um, it, which you could argue are similar. Just wondering if you but, use a landline network to trigger the Oh, up, yeah. Or, or any other infrastructure. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's really just a software sitting there, right? And so as long as you can send it a message, it wakes up and it goes. So that's a great idea. Uh, so again, the base station again, whenever it goes idle, it goes back to sleep. Oh, the first question is about the amount of time. That's what it was. Uh, that's just a heuristic. You, we, 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 yeah, we just dialed it up, dialed it down, dialed it up, figured out how it went. 
Uh, can it react or press the button? Yeah, and then yeah. so it takes about, uh, you should see the paper NSDI, we actually have statistics. We took a bunch of phones and measured how long they take to attach to the base station. It's about 20 seconds. So th this has about 20 seconds of latency. You press the button, 20 seconds you'll see signal and you'll be able to make your communication. That's an average. The worst case is about a minute. So basically we have to be up for more than a minute, for example. Um, in our network we chose five minutes because that's a timeout of two SMS deliveries. Things like that show up. Um, so once we get to virtual coverage, um, this basically lets us cut the power budget in about half. So now we're getting a base station to around $10,000, which is really a price point that, that, that we're shooting for. Um, I don't know why. I think maybe I should have kept a slide in which explained why I got to half, but trust me. You'll see some data later. Um, so that was the power piece. So now we've gotten cheaper base stations. We've got cheaper base, stations, base station installs. That's only half the problem. Uh, the other problem is really making it so that smaller organizations can run these things. So that communities can run these things, or individuals or even NGOs. So let's first define community cellular networks. Community cellular networks are uh, owned and operated locally. Uh, the argument for this is that local actors are more efficient in rural areas than non-local actors. Uh, and this is an economic efficiency. My own version of this, being from Alaska, is redneck engineering. This is where you can sort of solve a problem with local tools and skills where if you are from telecom cell or a big carrier, you go back to Jakarta and get equipment and come back and everything gets significantly more expensive. So you're able to also use local infrastructure, which is what you were mentioning. Um, this is, for instance, partnering with a person who has a generator or a solar panel or partnering with other uh, organizations in your community. And that's harder to do if you're a big, big, big actor. Basically, the costs of uh, negotiating are going to start to dominate if you're doing a whole bunch of these. Uh, and lastly, locals just sort of care about their businesses. They care about equipment. They care about the things that they've invested in. And so if we can get more investment from local people, this stuff is just going to survive longer. Um, community cellular networks are small scale. This is really just trying to enforce that, that property of external actors being inefficient and local actors being efficient. So we kind of expect community cellular networks to stay under 10 nodes. Uh, after that, you're starting to run a full-on telco, and then you'll have different problems. Uh, you could do it with the tech, though. Um, and lastly, community cellular networks support local goals. Uh, when you are coming in from a multinational telecommunications firm's perspective, they're largely profit motive driven. They have sort of simplistic goals of revenue in this. But if you're part of the community, you might have different sets of goals. My favorite example of this is, uh, for instance, if you're running a, uh, a health NGO, you might just want to put up a cell phone network so that your people can communicate with each other. Profit doesn't necessarily need to be the driving force. And then maybe you could provide that to the community to uh, and generate profit off of that. Maybe you don't because you want to have good service. Uh, there's a couple examples of these. Um, the Rhizomatica network in Mexico is a good friend of ours, Peter Bloom. So Peter is running a full-on cooperative cell phone network using very similar technology to ours. Uh, and that, that community decided that they're not going to charge for local calls at all because it's a community network. So these are decisions you can make as a community that are really hard to make as a bigger firm. Um, and hopefully... So Naive question. Yeah. Does any of this interconnect with the actual global like, yeah. self It has network? to. It has to. So then how does that work? Like how, do you, how does the local um, like community network... It's, a, it's like a gnarly Wild West business. Uh, and uh, you'll see some ugliness here. Our network in Papua uses Swedish phone numbers right now for this reason. Uh, so everyone in this little tiny community in Papua has Swedish phone numbers. And there's been some sort of uh, friction because of that, but not a lot. So uh, you just have to sort of hustle at that point, and hopefully we as technologists make that job easier for them. So wait, it's all long distance calls, and they want to call, like international calls? Um, it would be, the network actually doesn't support outbound calling right now, only SMS. And the calling is because our VSAT is completely congested. It's just full of Facebook. Uh, and so we just, like, the calls are just terrible. And so we have to double the capacity of the VSAT, and that's a little too expensive. So the operator isn't, we don't make decisions on our network. Our operator makes decisions. The operator doesn't want to do that. Like he says, I'm going to have to double the cost of the VSAT. I don't think I'm going to get that much revenue back. We're not going to do it. So now it's SMS only. But yeah, if, if they were making calls outbound, it would be from Sweden, and it would be long distance. Right now, all the SMS is long distance, which is like a, a big negative bias on a lot of our results as we go forward. Just curious, shipping money to Jakarta, I mean, are, are there also cases where the Tanto will infer a loss to install? the base station in a rural area, potentially for the benefit of urban people, they want to call there, right? So I mean, in some sense, 
you're the benefit of a subsidy from. Yeah, I mean, outside. there's like strict subsidies, right? There's USO as a strict subsidy of we take money from the urban areas and put it in the rural areas. Um, yeah, I mean, these are all business decisions that the telcos make. At the same time, there's 700 million people without coverage, so those 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 uh, functions only go so far. I guess it depends who's actually paying for that. So, like, it might be people elsewhere that are paying to call in, mm -hmm. as yeah. opposed to people there that are paying to call out. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so, I guess if you, if you lose the connectivity to the outside world, you also lose. The revenue source of people who are trying to call in. Right? In a way, they're paying for your local network. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, so, if you're running one of these community cellular networks, what sort of choices can you make about your network is the next question. Uh, first, we get to licensing, which is the, the, the big elephant in the room with most of this, which is that you, know, you could run a full legal li license. Uh, the Rhizomatica network has a, a, a special temporary license from the Mexican government to run their network in indigenous communities. They're forbidden from making a profit. So often when you come in with a legal license as a small operator, it's really hard. It's just, you, these licenses are millions of dollars, if not billions in some countries. And you don't have that. You, you, know, you have $10,000. Uh, so you can also operate without a license, which is surprisingly functional in rural areas, as I was mentioning. It's just, you go out there. Nobody's monitoring anything. It's fine. We've got a whole, all of the spectrum is available to you. You're not going to step on anybody. Our network, uh, well, I'll go into it a little bit later. We're running as a, a, a gray network. This is sort of tacit approval from the regulators. We went and talked to the regulators. They were like, you know, just stop telling us anything and it'll be fine. Um, <laughs> you can also decide if your network is open or closed. Um, an open network is basically available to anyone. You buy a SIM card, you get on the network, you go. A uh, closed network is something you see mostly in places like uh, oil rigs. These are networks where you have to come in and do something special to get access. Um, the Rhizomatica network is closed, ours is open. Uh, you get to choose naming and numbering. At, th at this point, when we're talking about this box, it's a full telco, to reiterate. And so you get to make all the decisions about the network. You can decide you could just have local only numbers. The Rhizomatica network has local numbers. We have global numbers. We pick those Swedish ones. Um, you can use Why did you pick Swedish ones? The cheapest ones we could find. Very simple. <laughs> um, they're still not that cheap. Uh, but you, you could share numbers. And you can actually have dynamic numbers inside the system because you get to do your own routing. So one example of this would be we had we had plans to implement this, but it never actually happened. But it was you would call a number, and you would get a certain like a list of nurses in the village. And so it would dial the first one. If they didn't answer, it goes to the second one. If they don't answer, it goes to the third one. And then that sort of randomly selects. So this would be an example of dynamism versus a sort of st more static numbering system. You, of course, get to set your prices. Uh, this is actually a, uh, an interesting variable that we haven't played enough with. But um, you know, what we see right now in most telcos is sort of a flat pricing scheme across the country. That's just because they want roaming. They want all this stuff. But in the earlier world, you used to have to pay when you would leave your country or state. Um, you still have to pay when you leave your country. You can build a prepaid system or a postpaid system. Most of the time you're going to see, see prepaid systems. Those are what you see uh, in most rural areas. And then lastly, you can just, it's a full PBX. You can build whatever service you want. There's like a whole research agenda on various PBX-y things. Zavage, Outlo, you know, just stuff you can build and put, uh, Poly, stuff you can build and put on a PBX and put in the network. Now you can do it and you can set the prices for it. And you can attach other services to it. You can give people credit. You can do all this stuff. So. There's a huge design space of stuff you can do as a community cellular network. So the stuff that we built is this thing called the Village Base Station. It's just a set of scripts for FreeSwitch 8 and OpenBTS to support this stuff. So um, eventually you'll be able to, in the dial plan in FreeSwitch, query for the user's location, whether they're online or not, uh, or give them data access or whatever. So this is all these sort of hooks to make it easier to write those complicated services. So that's community cellular networks. That's that thing we built. That's that idea. So we deployed both community cellular networks and virtual coverage in uh, Papua, Indonesia, starting uh, December of last year. Uh, Papua is a very, very interesting place. It's incredibly sparse. It's about nine people per square, uh, square kilometer. And almost all of them are located in the capital in Jayapura. So if you go into other places, it's just empty. Um, there's no internet, no fiber to the entire island. Everything on the island is VSAT. So even the major telcos use VSAT and their service is horrible. It was like yelling through a tunnel trying to call someone in, like, next to me in Wamana, which is the capital of the highlands. Um, so we work in the Balium Valley. The, the Wamana is the capital here. They have cell phone coverage. They actually have two providers on two different towers. But you go about four, uh, four miles outside of town 
and it just drops. It's just gone. And then there's no signal for a very long time. So the big cities will have it. Wamana is, I think, over 100,000 people. Um, but even a little bit outside of that, you'll lose that. This is like some weird tourist map because I couldn't find anything else for Wamana. Um, the community we deployed our intervention in is uh, it's called Deza. This is an anonymized name on account of running a pirate network. Um, it's about 1,500 people. It's a sort of local regency. It is a big hub of the missionary network uh, from a long time ago. And so it's still got a lot of sort of cachet in the local communities. Um, but it doesn't have any phone service. The road is quite terrible and goes out all the time. There's no grid power. There's no uh, community-wide network available. Um, about 1,500 people, as I said. But, but you do see phones. And this is always, I mean, all of you will probably know this. But even in areas without coverage, you see phones. Um, this is a 10 watt solar panel attached to a hut and here's the inside of it. They have a karaoke machine and a bunch of phone chargers. And you still have these phones primarily for media purposes. You, there's nothing else to do but listen to music, maybe watch TV if you can get a nicer phone. Um, and so the phones are there. We actually ran uh, our base station for a while just listening and we had over 2,000 requests to join the network. So we saw 2,000 phones in our time there, which is more than the population. Um, so even in these rural areas, the phones are there. There's a clarification. To yeah. join a network, you need a SIM card on the phone. Yeah. So if there's no network, why do they have a SIM? So we, we our network right? was up. So they, tr they basically send us a message requesting access, and we reject them because they don't have a, our SIM card. No, but they have if there's SIM no card. coverage, yeah. why do they have any SIM card on their phone? Well, they never took it out. So maybe they so go the to one. The phone was acquired originally yes. for some communication purpose. They yeah. moved here. Well, I don't know if it was necessarily sold. for that purpose, but it definitely is used in part for that purpose. Oh, so so many, many people go to Wamana, which is four hours drive, and communicate. Yeah. And so that's mostly what we saw was uh, Telcom Cell, which is the big carrier there who has good coverage in Wamana. So we, yeah, supporting Telcom Cell is our number one priority for that reason. But yeah, that's as many phones as has, have SIM cards. Your phone actually will try to camp without a SIM card, um, but it will camp in emergency mode. It's a little complicated. I don't even think we covered that. A lot more phones, actually. There might even been, yeah, absolutely. There could have been even more phones. Media only phones. I'd be surprised though, SIM cards are really cheap and people do go to Wamana. You just can't get that much done in Deza on its own to make sure I don't say the right name when I'm being recorded. Um, so Deza ha is, is like a full feature community. I don't want to do like this, you know, ooh, it's the middle of nowhere thing. It's got an airport, a military base, hospital, police station, and three sort of very large uh, Papuan churches. So Papua is Christian, the rest of Indonesia is Muslim, and so the churches are sort of a complicated political landscape. The military base is for the Indonesian military because there's a free Papua movement and they're present. But the big thing is it's like a, it's a full, full community. Is the military considered in your population? Right yes. Well? So 1,500 people includes the military. Yeah, it's not a huge base. It's probably maybe 100 people. Um, they're just, you know, the only ones with guns and they, they play that cool game where you like kick the ball over the net like it's soccer. It's, anyway, I don't remember what it's called, but it's awesome. I was just watching though, I didn't, I, I didn't want to try, it was scary. Um, so we work with a local missionary school. Uh, this is run by a community organizer, it's a, it's a, a white American dude uh, who was actually lived in Southeast Asia for his entire life doing missionary work. He's a child of missionaries, he like, this is, this is his life. So he's been in the community for, I believe, seven years in, in that particular community, Deza, and in Papua for, I want to say, 15. So he's been there a long time. Uh, and his school already has power and network. Uh, so they've got a multi-kilowatt hydro install. Um, this is for powering laptops and things. They're trying to do like a really nice education. Uh, so they get funding from, you know, U.S. people providing missionary money, and they build out this thing, uh, and as well as a VSAT. And this is primarily used for Facebook to keep the teachers in contact with their family. So they bring teachers from other communities in Papua, and um, those teachers will leave if they can't talk to their family. Family's super important. So they give them uh, Facebook, and a lot of communication happens over Facebook. But it's only a 512 kilobit link, and that's a 10 to 1 contention ratio. So in the middle of the day, it's about a 51 kilobit link. So with that, with Facebook, we can't make any calls. Um, so you can see the satellite dish here. Uh, these are two tech workers at, at um, the, the operator, which is uh, Womanacom. Um, so we actually installed the base station into this weatherproof box. You can see me here doing that. Um, these are two teachers and the tech guy. Um, I just want to state how incredibly important it is to be bug proof. This is all cockroach feces, which are apparently conductive. They've lost so much equipment to cockroaches. Uh, so the inside of the box is pristine. Outside of the box is ruined. But we, we tower mount, we, we pole mounted it and put it up this tree. So this is some of that uh, redneck engineering I was speaking of. If you install a tower
power in this community, it's no doubt $50,000. I mean, getting it there is mind-blowing on its own. The road is horrible. But with this solution, we just sort of rope it to a tree and rope it to a pole, and, and, the, and the problem is solved. So this is obviously much, much cheaper than a real tower. Um, there's two teachers on the top, and again, Rudy, the tech guy, on the bottom. Um, we also installed our virtual coverage wake-up radios. Uh, we installed them in a couple commu or lo local kiosks, which is like a store, basically, uh, throughout the community. There were three of them installed, and we just sort of taped them in place because we, we didn't think to put those little things so you could zip-tie um, on our, in our industrial design. We don't really know what we're doing there. So you walk up, you press this button, you get signal. And it goes down between 11 and 6 at night, which is when the hydro is down because the, the reservoir needs to be refilled. So during that time period, there's battery backup. You walk up, you hit the button to get coverage. Um, the idea was to install it in these police areas so maybe people wouldn't steal them. Uh, we think one was stolen um, in, uh, in the, the length of our, our deployment, um, which is bad. But like I said, we were a little bit smarter about industrial design. It'd be a lot harder to steal them. So the network itself, as I said, is a gray network. Uh, we had this handshake agreement with the <coughs> operators. Uh, we, we built it as an open network, so what you do if you want to connect is you come and buy one of these tier SIM cards, uh, and that'll give you access to the network. Um, this credit is, yeah. Uh, so the, the credit seller, who's this one of the teachers, uh, knows a special short, short code which lets you provision your, phone, your, your SIM card with a new phone number. So you put it in, you send an SMS to a certain number, and you get a phone number. Um, we have these Swedish phone numbers I mentioned earlier, and then we have static numbers, but there is a little bit of funny business there, which is the doctor police and the local operator all have short codes in the network. Um, this is actually almost entirely useless, uh, but mostly done to get these people's buy-in. Um, we, we, the doctor just, we gave them basically a SIM card which will let you communicate locally only for free, and the doctor just abuses it. But we, everybody loves the doctor because uh, he's a really good doctor and he, he could be in a much better place than, than Deza. So everybody's happy with that. Uh, the operator chose all of the prices of communications, um, and they charged nine cents for an outbound SMS and two cents for a local SMS and two cents for a local call. And there's no outbound calls. And all the local services are free. Um, payment was done through a credit system that Shady built. So this is that teacher. Uh, I forget what his anonymized name is, so I'm not going to say his name. Um, People come to him and they would buy credits. So originally we built this system so that uh, there was a different teacher who was going to do this job. Because this guy is actually fairly busy. He's like a really good teacher. So he didn't want to be harassed all day by people coming and buying credits from him. So we handed it off to this other person who was, was the husband of a teacher. They just had a kid. So he was going to sit at the house, watch the kid, and this was going to be his supplementary income. The church decided that they didn't want this commercial thing happening on their property. Which is really weird because the school was already selling chicken. Uh, they're the only place with a, um, a fridge, so they were selling chicken to the community. Um, so we had to build a different system. So what it is right now is that this guy actually sells credits to people in the community, and they resell to the community. So he sells to, to kiosk store owners, and the kiosk store owners go on from there. So we sort of built an actual completely functional credit transfer system and credit sort of buying system. Uh, and all of that happened without, like, without our participation. Just curious, coming back to virtual coverage, yeah. we have this global connection. How do the users think about emergencies originating from outside? I mean, do they want to receive? So, uh, I guess I, you know what, I, I skipped that part. Incoming, it works just fine, right? Like, it's an incoming message, we just wake the base station up. Uh, okay. So, so, I don't know if I want to go back all the way in my slides, right? So the base station's asleep, no one's got signal, an SMS comes in for a user, right? So we wake the base station up and just hold on to it until they, they come back on the network and then hand them the message. Oh, for SMS, but you wouldn't be able to call them. No, you, you just have to wait a little bit. Basically, we would put them on hold and then wait 30 seconds for the phone to come up and then connect them. So either one would work. In our network, it's trivial because it's SMS. And this is why we set the timeout to two times the SMS timeout, because we wanted to wait and make sure that they got the message when it came in coming. Um, but it actually works just fine. So emergencies incoming are even better than emergencies outgoing, because you don't even have to get up and hit a button. I went a little too fast to the slides. I missed that piece. Yeah. My bad. Uh, so we built a bunch of services on the network as well. Credit transfer I told you about. SMS broadcast is basically just sends SMS to everyone in the network. We mostly use this for announcements. Group SMS is like an SMS mailing list that Shadi built real quick. Um, this is primarily used in the community for, by the teachers for organizing events. It's like, hey, we're going to play soccer. That happened multiple times. Those local shortcodes I told you about. 
we built this thing called Days of Idol, which didn't really work. It was a singing competition. Because uh, again, everything's free for us, so we're just going to sort of play around a little bit. You would call in um, and sing a song, and then in a week later, you call into the same number, and you get set to a random song you haven't heard before, and then you get to rate it. And whoever at the end wins gets some free credits in the network. We ran it a couple times. It was actually like, I feel like there's a lot of weird social stuff going on, and I'm not in the community to be able to figure out what's going on, because no one's saying, everyone's saying in Bahasa Indonesia, which is the sort of national language, and no one's saying in the local language, um, despite there being multiple local people singing, as far as we could tell. So I think they have an interesting view of the network. Um, there's, there's a lot of tension in, in, in between those two communities, the sort of Austronesian, uh, Indonesian peoples, which are sort of more Asian looking, and the um, Papuans who are more Aboriginal uh, looking, like Aboriginal uh, Australians. So they have different languages, and there was, it was just weird that we got this entirely one set of languages from this. Um, and so I'm, I'm, when I go back, that's one of the first things I'm going to go look at and try to figure out what's going on. Delivery receipts were interesting. So there was this politician, so that you, you, it's an SMS only network, right? So you send SMS, and you don't hear anything back. You don't know why. And so people thought it was us. And we were like, all right, we're going to make sure it's not us. So we implemented delivery receipts, which just tell you when that person has received the message. And the big driver on this was this politician who was trying to use it all the time. Because right now, Deza is being merged into a nearby district. And they're not sure which district. And there's two political parties sort of fighting over it. And he's in the middle trying to play a game. And so this service has been, he's one of the top users of this service. And he really, really wanted to know when his messages got there. Uh, so he asked for this. We implemented that. Find a friend we canceled. Find a friend was, uh, Tap and I have tried to implement chat roulette on various services multiple times because we just think it's awesome. So find a friend was basically chat roulette in our network. So this was, you would call someone and it would connect you to someone you'd never talked to before. And if you talk to them for a certain amount of time, you'll get credits in the network. The idea was there's like five communities roughly inside of, uh, inside of Deza. There's the three churches, there's the military, and there's the police. Uh, and so we wanted to sort of break down some of those barriers. So we started piloting this thing and someone was like, well, what happens if you get connected to someone's wife? It's like, well, well, that's not good. Like, uh, that's actually going to maybe make things worse. And so we just sort of killed it for a little bit. I think there's an answer. We've, we've implemented a version of it that does, like, you have to, when you call in, that it, it puts you on the list of people who can call. But it's, at the end of the day, it's got to be random. And I don't know if we can just do gender splitting, if that's any better or... Yeah. Uh, there's just there's been some work on this in China as well. And it's it's really hard. <laughs> we can talk about it later, but it causes all kinds of problems. I yeah, that's. I really wanted to do it though, but yeah, it was clear that it was uh, not even half baked. Uh, so these are all the services we put up on the network. Uh, the network went live on February 11th with these Swedish phone numbers. Uh, we later turned on Boke Island delivery receipts. Uh, I think it was within the month. So here's an analysis of the network's usage. Yeah. I mean, is that a profit motive? Here? Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a profit motive. So we'll get to that a little bit. The operator, which for some reason isn't in this deck, um, is this guy, uh, he's another missionary dude. Um, he runs a, a wireless internet service provider in Wamana. So he runs this thing called Wamana.com. And what they do, uh, so, I mean, he runs it as a for-profit operation. He ran this as a for-profit operation as well. So we, deciding we're technologists, we don't want to come in and set policy, say, hey, charge whatever you want, you tell us, we'll implement it. And so then he just set those prices. He set those based on what his normal measures were for setting prices, which is like the amount it costs times four, roughly. You gave the equipment everything? Yeah, we gave them the equipment. So it's just OPEX costs that he's trying to? Yeah, I mean, basically the idea for him, I mean, this is a, he's, he's a pretty wealthy dude. He made a bunch of money in the States before uh, becoming born again and moving overseas. So this is, he just believes that you have to generate a profit for something to be sustainable. Um, a bunch of the profit goes to the school, for instance. Like it pays entirely for the satellite link now, um, and so sort of these broader sustainability things. So it's more of a philosophical thing than anything else. Like for instance, we're charging two cents for local SMS. Local SMS is free for us. It doesn't go to anyone else's network. It costs us nothing. He just know he he wants to charge money for things because he thinks otherwise they're abused. And that is a perspective, and we're happy to support anyone's perspective on these networks. Like I said, with the Rhizomatica network, they don't charge for anything for local anything, and their network is horribly congested, and they're trying to figure out how to solve that. So, and they're trying to solve it without um, market forces, which is super interesting, but hard. So that's, it, it was mostly philosophical. So analyzing the virtual coverage usage, uh, here's the numbers of unique wake-up events that happened in a, in a four-month trial, roughly. 
So we saw about, I think it was 60-something wake-up radio button presses. And we say unique means if you just hold it down, it only counts as one. If you hit it multiple times, it only counts as one. These are like separate events that have some time between them in different wake-ups. So it's not super common for people to come and press the button, but it's not super uncommon either. Uh, it's maybe one every other day by this on average. Um, while the number of incoming SMS is actually quite high. An incoming SMS will also cause the base station to come on. Uh, and if you continually communicate, the base station will stay on. Every time there's a message, it wakes up, or it stays woken up and resets a timer. So as long as there's constant communication, it'll go. So this is coming from outside. These are coming from outside, these are coming from inside, yeah. Different wake ups. And there's a bit of a time zone thing. Papua is two hours ahead of Jakarta, which is where a lot of people are. Um, so things go dark in, in, in uh, Deza significantly before they go dark in Jakarta, and despite the fact that also Jakarta you know, is a full bustling city and Deza is not. So yeah, this is sort of expected. But the core point here is that there actually is, is usage. And if we, uh, well, here's the, uh, wrong slide. Here's the usage over time at night. And you can see what I was saying with there's just a lot of usage early in the night and then it drops off um, as the other people uh, in the other parts of Indonesia uh, also go to sleep. But a key point is consistent usage. There's always usage at any hour. So really that uh, is hitting that emergency, or not necessarily emergency, but that, that there's clearly a desire for communication to these periods. So here's the number of messages sent uh, in the network at those times. So there was about 755 inbound SMS and about 390 outbound SMS during the night time periods. Um, this is different than with the daytime percentages. You can see they're almost equal. These are significantly unequal. And it's just, I mean, it's harder for someone to send an outbound SMS because they have to walk somewhere and hit a button versus the inbound one where it just arrives. Um, but in total, we saw 400 or 1,400, or roughly 1,500 communications throughout the night. So this is a non-trivial amount of communications that basically virtual coverage enabled. Otherwise, we would have to do hard duty cycling. So it really works for what we're trying to do. Uh, here's the CDF of how often the base station could be asleep, basically. Um, what you see is the ideal is assuming that um, we just try to handle every communication that happens in the network. The red line is the actual amount of power saving the network. You see sometimes we were actually on for over six hours at a night. Um, this was some people taping or holding the button down the whole night, uh, which was a horrible design decision on our part because if you did that it worked. It should have just gone off once, but if you held it down it would go off constantly. So, you know, batteries are going to burn out real quick, all this sort of stuff. They eventually figured out that it didn't do anything, but my intuition is that people didn't recognize that the incoming messages basically would uh, come in even if they didn't have signal. And so if they were waiting for a message, they would just hold down the button and wait for the message. Uh, and sometimes the, mes the, the message never came. So this happened like two or three nights, but it was sort of a dominant thing on occasion. Uh, in conclusion, uh, it was... Plenty of usage at night, it was off for 87% of the night, and it reduced the total power by about 56%. So that's where we get that, that earlier price savings, about cutting the, the budget in about half. So we also did a sustainability analysis of this network. Um, and here's the number of users in the network over time. This is somewhat of an old graph. This is, we ran out of phone numbers for a little bit, and so there's a dead period, but steep growth and then trailing off. Up to, uh, I think this, at this point, in, it was 187 users. Uh, here's a more recent graph over time, and we started to separate active and total users. So over 220 users, or total uh, SIM cards sold. Active users are how many people are actually using it each month. There's a big lull in the summer as people went uh, to other places, probably back to family. Since we're so closely connected with the missionary school, there's a lot of teacher usage and things like that. But it again picks up, and has continued to do so. So we're seeing uh, roughly 160 active users per month uh, in the network. Here's the service usage of all the services in the network. Not all of them, but uh, the most important ones. Uh, and obviously, the important fact here is that first it's up and to the right, which is great. And uh, outbound SMS and inbound SMS dominate, which is what is expected. Uh, although, I mean, I've seen some people arguing that local communications are always going to be important all this. Really, when you're in one of these communities, you can go knock on someone's door. You can't do that for someone in Wamana. And so this is an important use case. It's about two-thirds of the communication is outbound. One-third is local. Uh, here's a more recent version of that graph as well. And see, we're up over 12,000 uh, outbound SMS per month. So we're starting to get a lot of usage. And even the local SMS is nearing uh, half that. What is the pricing difference between outbound SMS and inbound? Uh, outbound SMS was 9 cents an SMS, and local SMS is 2 cents. So that yeah. could also maybe reducing 
Yeah, no, I, I think. Well, I mean, the, the expensive one's already dominating, right? Like, the expensive one is the one so that's being used. More. It might even dominate more, yeah. I would expect it would, in fact. Um, but if we really, really made local SMS cheap, it would probably get closer. Uh, calls are sort of a medium thing. We're not really sure about this. My guess is, honestly, the base station doesn't handle the calls very well for a variety of technical reasons. Uh, mostly that things crash. The SMS is really good about things crashing because the trash is and it just sends the SMS again later. Um, Maybe things crash. What, what? Open BTS crashes. We're using like an old version because I had to hack some special stuff into it and we haven't done a big code merge in a while. So uh, when I was there, calls were a little shaky and we've seen days where there's just no calls, which means that there's a, a, a fault in base station. Um, so we don't know if that would pick up if we fix that or not. It's certainly a thing, but the SMS is, is dominant. In Indonesia, SMS is generally dominant. Um, it's Latin script, so it's really easy to do there. Uh, so we, in the sustainability analysis, we have, we're going to build two different models of what a network like this would look like. One of them uses shared infrastructure, which I think is really, really important to understand. Um, when you're running one of these networks, that informal structures around you and the ability to use things of your friends is a key thing to make this network cheaper. And so under one analysis, we'll assume that we use shared infrastructure to share the VSAT and power that we already have there. In that case, the total capital expenditure of this network is only $9,000. Now, if we actually have to buy everything, which is a worst case analysis, but happens, um, we're, it's about $15,000 to install our equipment in that, in that tree. So with these two models, assuming a five-year loan at 12.4%, this is the Indonesian World Bank rate, uh, we, I should have moved this slide. This is the revenue network, I'm gonna skip that. We see this is the monthly profit in the network. So in the shared and non-shared models. And even at no growth, you see $368 in profit for the operator. 66 in the shared model. This is at no growth, and this is the analysis that's somewhat old. So um, even moderate growth, we can get up to near 500, and the actual number is 500 right now, based on actual growth of the network. So this is paying off the entire base station in five years, and getting a whole new one. So this thing is great. This is much stronger than I've seen of a lot of similar telecommunications infrastructure projects. Like, this is with all of our negative biases. We're buying Swedish phone numbers, which are really expensive compared to buying wholesale. Like, we're buying them at, at market rates, which is about 50 cents a month for a number. Um, if you were a big telco, they're literally free. Uh, as well as our communications cost us about one cent per SMS. Uh, if you're a telco, they're, again, almost free. So a lot of these costs would even, uh, a lot of these biases are there against us. And, Who are you yeah. sharing it with? There's only one base station, right? And the, the infrastructure is what's mm -hmm. shared, right? This is the power and network primarily. Shared with the school. We shared with the school, exactly. So the, the non-shared models where we just don't share anymore, we just buy all of it for ourselves and set it up. And so there's actually installation on a mountaintop right now that's non-shared. There's nothing else going on. But in, in days that it's shared. Did you, did you budget for things like expertise? Your time, basically? My time, no. My time is not in this budget. We do a budget for uh, maintenance from the WISP. Uh, but no, manufacturing and coding is not, I mean, not manufacturing is in there, coding is not in there. But at the same time, this is, you know, all open source stuff right now, they can just run with it, worst case. And it's a Linux box that sits in a tree, they don't really have to do too much to it. So yeah, I've definitely given my labor away for free. Welcome to graduate school. Um, so here's the profit for the credit resellers themselves. The primary reseller is that guy I was telling you who sells to the people in the community who then resell. Um, so he's got a very small markup because he sells in bulk. Um, he moved about $4,000 worth of, of credit um, and made about $37 or $36 per month on about 10 sales. So he's making a reasonable side business. Um, the first and secondary sellers, these have moved around somewhat. We now have a third. I think the first fell out. We have a third and there's moving up to a fourth. These are all uh, Indonesians instead of indigenous people. Um, primarily because those are the people who have capital in the community. And the fourth one is going to be an, in, uh, an indigenous person and we're interested to see how that goes. Um, but this guy actually you can see undercut <laughs> secondary one as a lower uh, margin but was able to make significantly more profit because of that. So he does about 290 transactions every month and makes $85. Which is, he's running a store, so it's, it's again a side business uh, because it's not that big of a community. But it's a reasonable revenue uh, for the community members and, and sort of the wider people involved in the network. So in conclusion, the network is financially sustainable. sustainable. It's actually like pretty strongly profitable. $500 a month is a lot for one of these base stations. Um, as I mentioned, this is a worst case analysis. We're financing everything. In a real world, you might expect subsidies for these, some of these things, especially with USOs going out there already. They give all these subsidies to major telcos to not come to these communities. 
Um, and so if you put any of that to, these, to this equipment, this stuff would get even better. And we're paying really high interconnect costs. So in my view, this model works. Uh, this is a profitable operation for both the operator and the community. The system has been running in this tree for eight months without any significant problems. Uh, we have a power switch that we gave them, which was super important. Uh, because basically if the network would go bad, they would blame the base station for a little while. And so we let them just do some A-B testing. They turn off the base station, Facebook still doesn't work. Okay, we'll turn the base station back on. Um, but if there's any problem that, you know, that, that major credit cell will just come in, turn it off, turn it back on. It boots up, it runs, network's available again. We got a lot of solutions like that. Um, we also did a bunch of user interviews with the people uh, in the community. And unsurprisingly, the primary use of the network was to communicate pe with people outside of DAISA, but not that far outside, just with family and friends, mostly to Wamana. Um, right now it's a four hour drive, it costs $20 to take a taxi, which is a pickup truck that you can ride in the back end. Uh, and so this just saves you money straight up. To get to $20, uh, it takes a little while on our network at nine cents an SMS. Um, also, there's a lot of people who have family, primarily like kids who go to university outside of DAISA. Uh, and so they're not able to communicate with them normally, but the network let them do that. And that was a big use case. Uh, the number one problem cited was from a couple of the sort of older members of the community who were worried about the youth using the texting in sort of bad ways. Um, it was, yeah, it, it was interesting discussion to have. So there's a lot of like churn going on inside that community. Uh, the Highlands were ostensibly discovered in like the n late 1940s. Like it's not really been sort of globally, uh, in, I don't know, enmeshed in any meaningful way. So there's just a lot of stuff is changing, and a lot of these social norms are changing, and there's a lot of. Um, worry about their kids having kids and HIV and a lot of these other concerns. So people are just, it's on their mind. And then this network comes in and suddenly they're not able to monitor their children's communications in the same way that they could before. There is this um, Indonesian girl who was actually our first customer. She's probably 16 and her dad came bought her the SIM card and all she does is text with her friends and it's like she's the local user. She's the dominant local user. Um, so it's not wrong, but at the same time uh, everyone is under the understanding that this is sort of Telecom, it's not about our network, it's about something broader than that. So people didn't really blame us, but it was definitely a problem that they viewed. Um, we asked a lot of questions about ownership of the network, because we thought this was a really interesting model to just drop into a community and how people would understand it. Um, and we got a just diverse range of answers. Uh, there was a comment that I was the owner of the network, which is, I think, fairly reasonable. Um, Mr. Regis is the guy who runs the school. He was credited as one of the people who made the network. Uh, and then there's actually somebody who thought it was a full community network. Like, because it's in the community and there's all these participants, it's a community network. So there was just a diverse range of answers. People were pretty confused, obviously. So, I think I'm done. Uh, we saved power. We're able to set, reduce the, the installation cost on one of these base stations. We're able to serve the community with over 200,000 communications at this point in our eight-month trial. Um, and we do all of this in a sustainable way with $500 a month in profit for the local operator and a lot of buy-in from the community. So we really think this is a good way to start to bring telecommunications to these rural areas. This bottom-up telecommunication is, is financially sustainable and uh, you know, works out. So what are we doing now? Um, we're starting to build a shared platform for these systems so that anyone could build one of their own. There's this new power amplifier design I mentioned earlier. Kasha's working on this, this TDMA version of it where we don't have to use the buttons anymore. Uh, we just got to find a really good power amplifier design. Um, and then we're starting to add more services. My favorite of which is data. Because we now have data support in OpenBTS uh, as of a couple months ago. So we could just turn that on in our network and I have no idea what would happen. Obviously people would use Facebook, but there's not that many smartphones, but those users probably, those are usually the wealthier users, they would probably pay for it. So I think the operator would be open to it, especially because that is also free for them, because it's just connecting to the internet without already paying for it. Uh, so that one's a big one we're, we're, we're looking at in the future. We have another deployment in Papua that just went up. It's on a mountaintop. We're waiting for the, the new antenna to come on. But this is supposed to cover three different communities. Uh, and this is going to be the first test case of sometimes the communication is going across communities in that use case showing up. Uh, we're going to expand it with data service, as I mentioned. And then we're really interested in this credit transfer system. Because as of a couple months ago, people started transferring credit to each other instead of just selling credit. Um, and so we don't know what's going on. They're not necessarily in amounts divisible by prices in the network. So it's certainly not a direct correlation to message sending. But we don't know if there's commerce going on or if we've actually created uh, a new currency. 
you know, sort of on accident. And one thing we could really, really do, or really, really easily do, is just come in and like give money to the credit sellers and have them cash out. Uh, and what happens when we have cash out? You know, w then we're a bank. Uh, yeah. Well, talk about yeah, yeah, like talk about bank. regulatory issues. Yeah. yeah well, you know, we're in for what is it? In for a penny? In for a pound? I believe is the. <laughs> <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Flash, basically. <laughs> it's, like, it's there. It's just sitting there. We could just do that. I mean, I'll, I'll wait for the day when it happens on its own, and I think it will at some point. Um, but it hasn't happened yet. But it's interesting, and I'm, I'm excited to work on it. With the Rise of Matica network, what they're really working on is uh, remittances, being able to buy credits from abroad to bring them into the network, and that's also super interesting. So I think there's just a bunch of currency stuff underlying all this base station stuff. Um, and lastly, we come to a policy, which is this GSM white space thing that Shadi and I put together. Um, so we've actually built it, and we're hoping to pilot it in the Philippines whenever things calm down there. Um, this is basically a base station that just scans the nearby bands through the phones, actually. They're a very clever technical solution uh, and figures out what channels are available. So that way, it, c it should be able to run, uh, at least in a safe way, even if uh, still in a legal way. But we have a reasonable amount of, of hope for being able to get this uh, licensed correctly in the Philippines. We're planning on deploying it in the U.S. as well. We think we can get a special temporary license here. So that's all. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay. No idea what time it is. I guess I'm... It's straight up 10. Boom. Okay, yeah, because the, the 30 minutes thing, man, it's just... <laughs> okay. Please go ahead. Have you talked to any operators about it? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so this is the, the biggest argument between Eric and I. This is Eric Brewer, my advisor. He really wants us to partner closely with telcos, and I don't like them, sort of in a broader sense. But at the same time, every time I meet with one of the telco CEOs, they're like, it's a really nice dude, invariably. Like we've met, I don't want to, I shouldn't say names, but they're like always really nice dudes. And so I'm getting a little bit more won over to that perspective. It's just, I feel like at the end of the day, uh, they're going to come in and they're going to take too much and... Um, it's going to limit the, the sort of adoption. So what is their reaction? Their reaction is that, well, there's a number of reactions. One is that this is illegal, and we're like, yeah. And that's what we're trying to fix. Uh, and then there's, um, all right, what's the business plan? How can we, what, what is our role in this? Is this CSR? Is this, like, they're just trying to find the business angle on all of this, when this is really more to me about uh, empowering local communities to solve their own problems. Uh, and you know, if you are a telco in the U.S., for instance, you have to provide certain interconnect options. Uh, it's in the regulatory framework. You have to be able to do that. And then these things could work. We have small telcos in the U.S. But overseas, you don't have that in a lot of places. So they just, they're in a position of power, and they're trying to figure out how, if anything, this can be leveraged to make their business better. Uh, and, you know, that's not my goal, but uh, sometimes those things can work together. So it's just, it's a big debate. There's not anything clear, and obviously nothing's happened yet. We think in the Philippines, we're most likely to pilot with a carrier with carrier support. Um, Afghanistan is probably the, uh, the other big option we've had, which is just to go out there and basically run these as a franchise of the main telco. And then they provide interconnect and you go. Um, but you know, they're gonna wanna take their cut. And traditionally there's this, there's this network in Indonesia, uh, Pacific Telecom I think, it went under. They were just doing that model. They would build similar equipment, put it up in a community. Uh, and I think, it, I shouldn't say names, there was a telco in Indonesia who uh, was taking 30% of their revenue straight up and it wasn't profitable and it went. And so they know they have power, they know they have regulatory approval, they know they have a spectrum license and they know it's impossible for us to get a spectrum license and so they'll come in and say 30% and then it's not feasible anymore. Like, w honestly, if they took 30% of our revenue, we would still be profitable. But um, that's not gonna work everywhere. It's obviously a bad thing for these networks in the terms of their sustainability. So what do you do with all the data? I assume you have, you know who's calling who, you know what they're SMSing, you have kind of that power, what do you you analyzed it, is it? Um, we've done some analysis of it, yes. We've done like graph theoretic analysis. This is a paper we have submitted right now. Um, are you asking about privacy stuff? I mean, sort of, yeah. Yeah, brought around privacy, we are at least as private as every other telco on earth. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is <laughs> maybe more so because it would take a little bit of work for the Indonesian government to come and ask us. We would give it to them if they asked. Right, um, you said you had well, like one big station in the mountain with three different communities. You could do some interesting analysis on we could, yeah. Uh, it's, it's like when you look at the night usage stuff. In that paper, we, we didn't really do any user interviews of night usage because we were really, like, we started to, and we had an anthropologist working with us in the field, and it's just like, this is, 
this is like morally gray questions to be asking because you don't really know what's going on. You don't know if people are going to be honest and it's just fuzzy. So we just didn't do it. And so we're in one of those situations with a lot of this data. We try to take a high level anonymized view. Basically the sort of thing that um, uh, you know, Telefonica would hand a researcher we, is anonymized. That's the level we want to work at, at best. But technically you could read all the rest of us. Technically we could maybe do that. I would wink, yeah, but okay. the <laughs> technically, high level. yeah, high level, exactly. It's a, it's a boon that none of us speak Indonesian on the technical side. Just one more question. So, you know, if you see kind of the biggest usage is SMS, yeah. are there other ways you can save power by optimizing for SMS? I mean, this is, this is an outsider question, but I mean, you need less bandwidth. I mean, do you need to run the tower at the same power if you're only the range is slightly higher on SMS, so we could uh, essentially run at slightly less power. But the way power amplifier design works is that uh, it's not like linear. It's like on or off. Like you can run a, a 10 watt amplifier at 5 watts, and it's going to draw the same amount of power as if it was running at 10. So there's not really any games to play there. Uh, now, if we do the uh, fancier duty cycling with TDMA, uh, an SMS is milliseconds of that slot being up. In which case, then, that's going to save a ton of power. Basically, we're going to be running at near u zero utilization constantly if we're an SMS-only network. Is that true for data as well? No. Uh, so data is closer to voice. It depends on what data you're sending, obviously. Um, but g like if a website will come in in a burst and be done. It's probably closer, but it's still going to be way more than SMS. I'm mean, thinking more about, about um, messaging. So like, you know, a very, very popular thing in a lot of places is using data for messaging instead of SMS. It depends on a lot of, it, you, you might be able to, it depends on the protocols they use. If they use UDP, you get some benefits. If they're using TCP, you get, you know. And maybe we can play some games inside the base station and make this better. I um, haven't really thought about it yet. But yeah, it's certainly, it'll be better than voice. Voice is the worst case. It's owning a whole channel, constantly transmitting at a very low data rate. Uh, you don't get much worse than that. So this is the OPEX cost you're saving, right? Uh, well, we save CapEx too by not having a diesel generator. Sorry, sorry, I got the opposite. Yes, uh, we save uh, OpEx by having by not having diesel generator. I think we can primarily save on CapEx by reducing the battery and solar panel installation costs and not needing a tower and all these things. I think those are the costs that are the biggest one being knocked down. But uh, if one night it has to stay up, then it won't. It will burn out. If it has to stay up the if whole you night. Plan for fifty percent. Yeah. On. What if one night it stays up sixty? Yeah, that would be a problem. You, I mean, you, you put some margins on these things, and you measure your usage, and if you're getting close to running out of power on some nights, maybe you put another battery in the battery bank. Um, these are solvable problems. But yeah, at the worst case, there's degenerate cases where we don't have power. I agree. So you're provisioning it for 50% in some sense? Yeah. Or we're provisioning it, what you should provision it for is usage plus something, so something exactly. Double usage or something like that, which if we did, it wouldn't be very different from our power measurements. Yeah. It's a good question, actually. I, it feels high, but I don't have any data on it. There's actually no census for this community, um, and as far as I know. And so everything is very informal. Um, but it feels high. Well, I mean, most of your, feel like most of your usage is from the school anyway. Th that could be a factor. I, wouldn't, I mean, it's 100 and, what, 160 active, right? So some people are losing SIM cards. We can assume maybe 200 people. Um, this starts to map pretty closely to households, I think. And so I would be surprised if our if it's, like, usage might be dominated by them, but subscribers is probably not dominated by the school. Uh, we, there certainly are o like some of the older missionary I shouldn't say missionaries um, some of the older church members these are Papuans uh, who were very uncomfortable with SMS uh, and wanted voice service. Uh, I don't know if that was a technical limitation or uh, a literacy limitation. I felt uncomfortable asking that. All right, thanks. Thanks, thanks. Thank you.